Phil Gary. I'm a faculty in uh, the Department of Psychology. Um, my, uh, I guess, first uh, you know, experiences related to this were teaching large lecture uh, courses, specifically introduction to cognitive psychology. And that has led kind of a uh, meandering path along um, a variety of different committees and things which I'd be happy to go into. But um, much of it has it centered around some work with learning analytics that I've done with uh, Tim. Uh, seeing at the different trajectories and experiences that students have at the University of Michigan. And when we teach these large lecture courses, we tend to see one undergraduate mass of people that's really not. Um, and people come in with very different backgrounds. And, uh, you know, typically, the at risk student who is someone who has come in at a, at a disadvantage uh, for one reason or another. And that uh, keeping that in mind is we kind of structure what we do in classes and try to personalize things a bit. Good, good afternoon. My name is Jill Halpert, and I teach mathematics in the Comprehensive Studies program. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that, this is sort of a, a destination support space for um, at-risk students. I mean, it's a very large umbrella of underrepresented students who are sort of underrepresented for all different reasons, the traditional reasons along race and class, and in addition, sort of geographically remote areas, sometimes English as a second language, learners, and so on. I see my wonderful colleague Doti is actually here, and she teaches chemistry in CSP, so she would be your point person here. Um, and in addition, way back in the day, I taught in the Upward Bound program, which is a program that marries um, universities to high school students in at-risk areas. I did that back at, at MIT back in the day. And um, yeah, it's a little bit of that. So I'm Tim McKay, and I come here from teaching in the Department of Physics. And I guess a, a thing that will emerge from the way I think about this is that I feel like I interact with and work with at-risk students because I teach at the University of Michigan. Like, at-risk is not an identity feature. It's something that happens to people. Uh, and it changes with different contexts and so on. So it's impossible to be a teacher at any university and not be working with at-risk students. So let me say something about uh, sort of analytic definitions of what at-risk is. So. Uh, universities have different, different levels of universities have different priorities. And the first priority for many university administrators and leaders, one that's very present on most campuses, is graduation. Graduation rates, right? So the first place you will see people talk about at risk is when they're talking about whether a student who enrolls will ultimately graduate. Now, the University of Michigan doesn't talk about this as much because our kind of global graduation rate is quite high. And the people who leave are leaving for a wide variety of reasons that aren't usually failure. So it doesn't seem like the first issue here. But if you go to work on any other campus, almost any university, graduation rates, retention will be a, a number one issue. And so the definition of at risk is a person who historical evidence shows has a relatively low probability of graduating. I think sort of, they're sort of like, um a global, you know, those like federal, state, local levels of talking about sort of at risk and diversity, which I think in our minds is a connected question. I'll say that in everyday discourse, I really don't use the, the phrase at risk. Um, there's something else that comes up, which is underprepared, which means students are coming in with less academic background than their average peer. And so we could then tag them also as being maybe at risk of not doing as well or at risk of not graduating. Um, I think um, Tim to, to made an excellent point about the fact that sort of at risk is not just a demographic like African American or this or that, but there are correlations there because of the structure of our society. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good way to look at that is, you know, when we think about at risk often we're thinking from our perspective as faculty or administrators, but thinking about it from the student's perspective, they don't arrive um, the vast majority of them thinking they're at risk for any of that. And in fact, many of them come here having done extremely well at you know, schools that are yes. less um, advantaged than other schools. And so that you know, there's this real critical uh, first semester when they arrive and are suddenly thrown into grading curves with other students or classes with students that come from very different backgrounds. And trying to understand that initial kind of feeling that students have um, is very important. And that, you know, that small window of time is really to set students off on different trajectories um, where they you know may decide you know can I do this uh, being a doctor thing that I thought I wanted to do um, which 
by the way, which is interesting, there aren't a lot of special techniques, in my view, for working with at-risk students. These are techniques that everyone can benefit from. But they're sort of like, sort of the politics of maybe like disproportionate return, right? So for students who need it most, it's going to have the largest effect. But lots of students want to crash CSP coming from other places because they find all these things, the individual attention, the extra practice, the support, all to be positive experiences. So it's not like we'd be dragging down our classes if we have some very gifted students who are well prepared, sort of mixed in with, and we're trying to address, how do we address the underprepared students without boring the other students? Well, I think that problem, that's one problem that in a small class, I think, has been at least partially solved. Well, and one of the important social aspects is help seeking, right? So imagine you're, you come to the U of M and you're feeling a little bit, you know, um, shaky about how things are. Help seeking can almost be an admission that, you know, you need help, right? And, and, and talking to students about why they don't go to office hours. I teach a class where I actually assign them to go to office hours, mm -hmm. a freshman class. And, that, you know, I, I hadn't anticipated this, but one of the students said, I don't want to there's this, there's this fear that that's going to be the case, whereas you know, the message I try to get across is that it's just a good study habit for everyone, and it's, you know, faculty appreciate that, and that that's an important step to being you know, fully a member of the university. And another part of the high school college transition is that these students in high school, even the whole high school system, has been built around a kind of perfection of record model, and they really expect <coughs> to have everything be perfect when they're in high school and in, in college. I have completely reframed, I actually call my class something. I, I call it CSP slash Teaching Learning Collective because it's kind of my own, own project that's been overlaid on CSP. And really, um, I treat the class as having just an entirely different philosophy that have, from the mainstream sections that happens to resonate well for at-risk students. So it's not as if the curriculum is designed to deal with average students. It's designed to be very personal, to have lots of activities, to do things that a lot of students can relate to. But these happen to be things that are particularly helpful to average students. So it's sort of an indirect targeting. So that's a piece. So you ask a very good question. I think students who feel stigmatized probably just brush off that identity as much as possible. But on the flip side, these students find a community in CSP that they often don't find in other places. And I think that tends to be the sort of the prevailing attitude. So rather than feeling stigmatized, they feel like, and you know, students say this, so I'll repeat it. Finally, I'm not like the black woman in SOS 101, right? They're in a space where they see a lot of people. They're no longer a minority, and so the, the focus can things, they see that they're really not alone, even if they feel like they're a small percentage of something, not just in terms of race and class, but even preparation. Um, I think that the, the key thing for me to think about here is that at risk is not a, a trait of a person. It's, um, it's a context-dependent thing. Every student who arrives here at Michigan, almost every person in the world, is fully capable of a wonderful, successful life. Right? But if you put them in, in, a, in a particular circumstance that's really mismatched to where they are at the particular moment in their life, then they might be at risk in that environment. 